I'm going to talk about four or more, for, so in other words, four, for some value of four, for some value of interesting, where I define what, what is interesting, and for some value of enigma-like, because I'm going to uh, pick machines which are a bit like Enigma, but some of them are less like Enigma than others. And in fact, we're going to talk about, uh, if I remember correctly, nine. But don't worry, five of those will be mentioned and dismissed fairly swiftly. First of all, what do I actually mean by Enigma-like? Uh, I'm going to run through a quick introduction to Enigma. Those of you who have seen my Enigma-based talks before, this introduction will be a lot quicker than the ones you've seen before. Enigma machines come actually in multiple, multiple designs and types. And this, uh, the tree I'm going to show you is from cryptomuseum.com, a website based in, uh, well, a, a, a virtual museum based in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And this is the full table as of 2009, of all the, all the possible Enigma machines and all the possible uh, types that existed in a handy tree. And just to give an example of what some of these look like, there's this splendid looking machine. It's an Enigma, it's part of the Enigma range. It has a printer. As you can see, it has a, a cranking handle just here to, to make the machine work. Um, I've never seen one. These pictures have also come from CryptoMuseum.com. This is a, a reduced Enigma machine, which only does numbers. So you can encrypt any number between zero and nine and get a, an encrypted result of any, some other number between zero and nine. Believed to be primarily used for the broadcasting of weather, weather reports. This is, um, this is what you might consider to be the standard for an Enigma machine. Um, this one is a four-wheel machine used by the, by the uh, German Navy. The, what I'm concentrating on most are machines in the range, in this range of four machines, the Wehrmacht 1, the M1 by the Kriegsmarine, M2 and M3. In other words, one of these or a machine much like it. And the main components are the rotors on the top with what is called a reflector. Now I'm going to run a quick animation to show how these relate to each other. A light panel, which is 26 light bulbs arranged in the order roughly of a German typewriter, excluding the ac accented characters that German has. So there's no umlauted characters and there's no S set double S character, so you just have the 26 standard A to Z alphabet. There's a keyboard aligned, uh, designed in the same way, and there's a plug board on the front, which allows you to switch any character to any other character, both on its way into the machine and on its way out of the machine. In other words, it's interposed between both the keyboard and the lamp board, the light panel. Uh, in the lid, there's this uh, there's commonly this documentation, which as I'm sure you can all clearly see, is uh, cleaning, is primarily cleaning instructions. But it does have some important uh, warnings on it, like you really must shut the door on the front once you've changed the plugs, otherwise you're likely to have more than, more than one light lighting up for each key that you press. So this animation, uh, which, uh, comes to me from a gentleman called Ralph Simpson, who's based in San Jose. Operates as follows. So first of all, first step is you hit a key on the keyboard. And I just hit the A key just here. <clears throat> and this starts current flow flowing from the battery and into the plug board. Now, an important thing that happens is the rotor's turn. The rightmost wheel always steps. The middle most uh, rotor steps once for every 26 steps of the rightmost rotor. And the left rotor steps for every 26 steps of the middle rotor. 
So there are 17,576 possible positions for the wheels to take while you are operating the machine. That is a first approximation. There are quirks that actually means it's a, a few hundred fewer than 17,576, but, we'll, but for the, our purposes, 26 cubed or 17,576 is enough for now. So the current is now flowing out of the battery and the switch is switched, it's a mechanical switch, and the current is now flowing through the switch that was operated, the A key, and goes into the plug board on the front. The plug board on the front has, in this particular case, been plugged into the M on the plug board. So the current now flows into the rotors, the rotor stack is no longer a letter A, it is now a letter M. And Encryption takes place, depending on how the wheels are positioned. In this case, the M has been changed into a B, which is then changed into a J, which is then changed into an F. Into the reflector and back again. So it's now come out, now coming out of the rotor stack as the letter O. The letter O, as it happens in this example, has been plugged into the letter H on the plug board. So it's the letter H on the plug on the on the uh, lamp board which is now displayed so i press the a key and we now have h lit up because the wheels have all stepped and will step once again if i hit uh, the a key again the chances are like unlikely that you'll get an h again although it's it's not impossible because in practice you get any one of 25 characters other that which represents the characters other than the one you pressed on the keyboard uh, comes back out as the on the lamp. So what do I mean by Enigma-like? A machine a bit like what just I've shown you. So wired rotors, where you have rotors with wires that go from one side to the other and contacts on both sides. And in this case, 26, but I'm, I'm not actually enforcing 26 in my definition. Keyboard, 26 keys or some other such number a lamp board or a printer, a plug board on the front. Uh, that one I'm making optional because not all the machines I'm going to talk about have a plug board or have some, or they might have something other than a plug board. The reflector, that was the topmost rotor on the left. I'm making that optional because some of the machines I'm going to talk about do not have a reflector. And rings on the rotors, by which I mean that each rotor is effectively in two parts. And the outside metal ring can be rotated relative to the wiring matrix of the inner part of the rotor. <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the rotor doesn't actually come off like that, but it can be rotated relative to the inner ring, the inner workings of each wheel. The, rotors, the, rotor, the ring setting is a subtractive relative to the rotor positions. So as it happens, if you have a rotor position of B with a ring setting of B, then that's equivalent to a rotor position of A with a ring setting of A, except for the fact that the turnover point changes with each stepping of the ring. So if I, for example, encrypt, um, this is a very long test message for turnover testing or some such, a note I've, I've in, I'm using X for space because there's no space bar on the Enigma. And this gets encrypted as that text that starts S R A E P X D and so on. And assuming I set I did that encryption with the with the with the rotor set to JFK and the rings set to EWR, then if I use JFK and EWR and type in the encrypted message, you get the original plain text. If I step on the rotors and the rings by one, so I now get JFL and EWS, then there's one character wrong in the middle. JFM plus EWT, two characters wrong, and so on. The settings of the rotor of the Enigma machine are defined in a coding sheet. And today being the 8th of September, if we go down to the column, the TAG column, day column, to eight, then it tells you on that row that the uh, reflector, Umkehr Walzer, is 
uh, the B reflector. There were at various times reflectors in the range A to D. This, this, uh, this coding sheet happens to only select B and C, and on this occasion today, we're using B. The Walzenlager. This defines which wheels are being used and in which order they are being inserted into the machine. So in this case, on the left, you have four, in the middle, you have three, and on the right, you have five. And the rings on each of those wheels is respectively 11, 19, and 01. The Steckerverbindungen is the, it's the plug board definition. So in this case, A is plugged into S, B is plugged into N, E is plugged into K. And note that these pluggings are reciprocal. So not only is A switched to S, but S is switched to A. B is switched to N and N is switched to B and so on. The last column, Ken Gruppen, is not actually that cryptologically significant. It's part of the plain text header. If people who are out in the field are receiving Enigma messages and they want to uh, know whether or not a particular message is for them or if it's for somebody else in the same network, and they can use the Ken Gruppen to decide whether or not a message is for them or for somebody else. In other words, whether or not they can ignore it. Uh, linguistically interesting. I happen to, as a bit of a hobby, uh, I'm interested in uh, languages other than English. And also, I'm also interested in writing software. And I try to write simulators for machines that interest me. So my first list. Four machines. First of all, there's a machine called the Nemma. This is not very originally named because Nemma, Neuer Maschine, which just means new machine, and is a Swiss post war development. It's uh, very similar to Enigma. It has the 26 key keyboard, it has the 26 key lamp board. There's no plug board, but what it does have is rather more wheels. Now, it looks as though there's 10 wheels, but in fact, there's four, because the leftmost one is the reflector, the rightmost one is the entry wheel, and the others are, are pairs. So you can see going along the row near the top, A, Q, A, N, O, U, M, L, P. And in this case, the rotors have their rings separately adjustable. So in this case, the leftmost rotor has its ring set to Q, and its actual position set to A. And then as you type messages, all of those, all of those wheels and their rings step. So that makes for a much more complex uh, alignment of the system. Fialka is a, a rather nice Russian machine. It's, um, it doesn't have a lamp board. What it does have is it has a punch and a printer. And not only does it have a tape punch, which is round on the right hand side, but it has a tape reader, which you can see just here. You can just see uh, two pins, sprocket control, and three more pins for a five track tape. So it can actually read tapes and emit them in encrypted or indeed decrypted form, depending on the switching for switch settings. Fialka just means a violet, by the way. So picture on the left, the violet is just a an indication of what I mean by a, a violet, it's a rather pretty little blue, bluish flower, bluish violet flower. Uh, also called in its Polish implementation the Fiolwek. It has no fewer than 10 wheels, five of which spin in one direction and five of which spin in the other direction as encryption proceeds. So again, it's the wheel motion is much more complex than the uh, than the Enigma. Instead of having a plug board, it has a card. So the card, the card, which is changed daily, replaces the plug board. So you insert the card and then you just slide that card carrier to the right, and then you've effectively got plug board settings set up for the day. The keyboard is, is quite interesting because it has up to four different settings. Um, as you can see, probably see the bottom left setting on each key is some Russian character. Uh, it also, this machine comes equipped, uh, equipped with uh, keys for languages other than Russian. And in this case, it happens to have Polish on it. 
So this key here has the uh, letter Z with a dot. This one is A Ogonek, A with a hook, E Ogonek, and L with a bar, which is pronounced as a W rather than a L. It doesn't, as it happens, have the entire Polish character set, and I'm not quite sure what you're supposed to do in the event of the other missing characters. But maybe the maybe leaving out those Polish other Polish accents is sufficiently unambiguous. You can manage without them. There's a connection on the side to which you can plug uh, uh, a power supply. Some power supplies actually operate a kind of tempest method, uh, methodology. As you're punching on the tape, you only punch one or two or three or four or five pins. And that means that there is some possibility, if you happen to be monitoring the power supply from, from some external eavesdropping uh, place, the power supply can detect which pins are being operated on the punch and fire its own uh, simulated punch pins, in other words, just resistors, so that the current flow out of the power supply and therefore into the power supply is constant. Uh, this is a broader view. Five pins on the right representing five uh, data bits and earth and so on on the left. And the, uh, this is a quick definition of Tempest, which is an NSA specification, and it covers both spying and protecting equipment from spying. So this Fialka, in some variations, in some variants, is Tempest compliant because it's protected from being spied upon. The pins represent, the, the pins on the uh, socket represent the holes on this tape that, uh, as a match. Each day, the settings are rather more complex than Enigma in that you first of all, you have 10 wheels and you can insert them in any order. So from left to right, the leftmost one is this Russian letter I and then D and then Z and then Z and then A and so on. And then V, K, B, G, Y. The second row tells you what the ring settings on those wheels are. So they can be any one of 26, uh, any one of, excuse me, 32 values. The third row is the identification of the core. So that the, in this case, the actual insides of the rotors can be swapped between the outsides of the rotors. So in this case, the leftmost wheel, it's got the rotor, I, but the inner core of B, and the second one has the rotor of D and the, and the inner core of D. The rotors, the, the uh, core can be inserted in one of two positions, either face up or face down. And this row here tells you that this, this rotor on the left has got the, eight, the two sides showing, and the next two have the one side showing, and so on. And finally, Last but not least, the core can be inserted in one of 20, uh, 32 positions within the rotor. So as you can see, it's much more complex than Enigma. Some while ago, I designed some hardware to monitor, to plug into the, what is effectively a Tempest connector. And doing that, I, I'm able to um, run a Fialka machine without actually having any of the hardware. Um, in this case, I've entered the Russian text Privyet, which means hi or hello, and it's been encrypted to B A U U A Y R. And then if I reset the wheels to their original position and type in B A U A Y R, you end up with Privyet as the original plain text. Next one. This one I'm going to say very little about because I know almost nothing about it. But it's a British machine and it's, it's quite similar to Enigma. It's similar enough to Enigma that it can be wired to simulate an Enigma. This photo I've uh, um, 
borrowed from the Crypto Museum again. If anybody wants to try this machine in software, then a colleague of mine at the National Museum of Computing, who goes by Virtual Colossus, has written this simulator, which you will find at typex.virtualcolossus.co.uk. He, is, he has been unable to use whatever ring, set, um, ring rotor wiring was used during the actual usage of the machine because it's never been released. So he's had to invent his own wiring, which I guess is fair enough. Our oh, machine, which I refer to and nobody else does, so this is just my special name, the Polska Franken Maschine. Now this machine is a standard German Enigma which mysteriously has five wheels on it. And the five wheels are upside down, uh, as you can see from the uh, lettering on the, on the rotors. And, uh, and of course the rotors have, have come from two different machines. And the because you can't close the lid, because the lid no longer fits, they've had to add extra wiring, which are those green and red bits of metal you can see, so you can work out, you can use those effectively as cursor positions. There is a definition of this uh, machine written by a colleague of mine, um, Mariusz Grajek, and I have produced a translation in a long time ago now, in the, in the before times. Now we're going to come on to my second list. And when I said there was going to be nine machines, I clearly lied because there's only eight. So, First of all, Polish Enigma. Now there's two machines in this list, both of which are referred to as Polish Enigma. One of them is incorrectly referred to as that, and that's the Lachida at the bottom. And the top one is a genuine Enigma, designed by Poles but, and built by French engineers. When the Poles were working to uh, decrypt German messages, they needed some Enigma machines and they couldn't steal or borrow or buy enough for their purposes, so they designed their own. And because they weren't too sure how the machine was designed, it has a number of, uh, a number of interesting uh, changes. So instead of having the standard German keyboard order, it has a keyboard which runs from A along the top, through J along the middle row, through R to Z along the bottom row. And the lamp board, which you can't really see very well in this, this picture is of course laid out the same. Now this machine is currently in the Institute Józefa Piłsudskiego, which is in the Polish uh, Social and Cultural Center on King Street, Hammersmith in London, uh, which is uh, conveniently available from the uh, Ravenscourt Park uh, District Line Station, should you happen to want to go see it. So, it differs from German Enigma. Um, keyboard, as I've said, A to Z rather than Q, Q, Q W, E, R, T, Z, U, etc. Lamp board, same as the keyboard. Plug board, same as the keyboard. It runs on an exter external power supply of either 220 volts AC or 20 volts DC. Uh, it's a three rotor machine, but it comes with five rotors and the two rotors which aren't being used are stored in the place where the German Enigma had its battery. Uh, the wheels have had to be wired from the best information available at the time after the Polish, Polish mathematicians, mathematicians and engineers had cracked the Enigma. So as it happens, wheels one, two and three are the same as the German Enigmas, but four and five have an offset of one. And this particular machine has the Umkehrwalzer, the reflector set to B. And there's a slightly better picture of the top. You can see the plug board is quite different. Um, there's only one wire going into each, into each socket. The plug board on the standard Enigma is, has two pins on each plug. Uh, I've, I've yet to manage to see what's on the end of those plugs, but I'm suspecting it's a two pin jack. So we have a, a collar and a pin in the middle to, uh, um, op to effectively behave like the uh, two wire plugs on the standard Enigma. You can see the two 20 volts and two uh, 20 volts plugs on the top left. You can see a switch halfway along, which is actually which shows an AC signal here, and just hidden by a wire is the DC flat line. And there's some testing sockets 
just here. Oh, and that's what I just said. Now, the Japanese enigma. Now, this isn't really very enigma-like at all, but it's got, it's being given, it's being christened, shall we say, as a Japanese enigma. And it looks like this. These are some pictures from the uh, NSA Museum in Maryland, the USA. You can see there are uh, four wheels. The wheels are numbered from one to 25. There are 25 keyboard keys. I'll come onto these leftmost two shortly. Um, and there are 25 lights here. Uh, there are, the lights are in, arranged in two rows, but the keys are arranged in three rows. You'll notice each key has a red letter and a black letter. And this is because there are more characters in this particular character set than you would, would really want to have keys for. And you switch between the red letters and the black letters by using these two keys here, the shift keys. The shift key not only uh, changes the meaning of this, well, in fact, it doesn't actually change the meaning of this, but it does change the meaning of this because the, uh, this uh, transparency shifts when you hit this key. So if you hit this key, it will shift upwards. And I've very recently in the last few days seen that these also turn red. So these are white because they are the representing the black letters. <laughs> <laughs> but when you press the upper shift, then they turn red. So you then get red for red. I'm going to quickly run through how Japanese writing works. First of all, you can use an alphabet. And we're all, I suspect everybody here is familiar with an alphabet. I've got, I've got examples of the uh, Latin alphabet used in English, uh, Greek alphabet, Russian alphabet. Uh, Hebrew alphabet, although I know that is not the correct term to be used because those characters also contain vowels. Um, but uh, I'm going to stick to calling them an alphabet for now. And then there's a syllabary, which is where you take every letter of the alphabet, which is a consonant, and every letter of the alphabet, which is a vowel, and you make a matrix from them. So if I was to do that in English, I have A, E, I, O, U, and Y for vowels, and B through Z without the vowels along the top as the consonants. But you'll notice I've put Y in in both columns because, in fact, Y can be both a vowel and a consonant. And there's some argument that says that W can be a vowel as well as a consonant, but uh, I forgot about that when I was doing this table. This means that your, your 26 letter alphabet has now expanded to 132 characters. And it's a feature of syllabaries that they are usually larger than alphabets. Uh, this is an example of an alphabet used in the province of uh, Nunavut in Northern Canada in the Inuktuk language, which is, uh, uh, which is rather pretty, but not relevant to this talk. Now in Japanese, we have a syllabary called katakana. And you can see along the rightmost column, going, reading downwards, the vowels, first of all, a, i, u, e, o, and then one column to the left, ka, ki, ku, ke, ko, and the next column is sa, shi, su, se, so, and so on. And you end up with 51 characters because as it happens, there is one letter in Japanese which is allowed to be on its own without a following vowel. And that is the letter N. And that's basically what I said. And a mnemonic which I was taught when I was studying Japanese one time was a kind samurai told Naomi how my yak ran wild. So the first A tells you that vowels come first. Then you have K for kind. So there's five syllables commencing with ka. Kikukeko, and then Saf, the samurai, Sashi, Susetso, and so on. And all the way over to Wa, uh, Wa, We, Wu, where, Wo, where actually two of the characters are no longer in use. And you, the, the N is not included, but you just have to remember the N is uh, the 51st letter. 
51 basic characters of which 20 can take a, a double tick diacritic and five can take a ring diacritic. And they affect the voicing and uh, pronunciation of the basic syllables. So ha with the double tick diacritic is pronounced ba and with the ring diacritic is pronounced pa. So we've now moved from 51 characters to rather more. So we've now included this section here as well. Now there's a second uh, syllabary called Hiragana, which is if effectively matches katakana on a one-to-one -one basis. Katakana is used in foreign words and sometimes Japanese company names. Hiragana is used for grammatical endings, Japanese words for which no Chinese characters or kanji exist, and grammatical particles such as verb endings and plurals and so on. It's a feature of Japanese that it uh, uses uh, a fraction of the Chinese character set. And the Chinese character set is lacking grammatical particles, so they had to create their own so that they could then use Chinese characters for the main sense of a, uh, a word, and then they can then put tenses onto vowels and negate vowels and so on by uh, verbs by using verb endings. You'd be surprised actually how much katakana is used in business in Japan. This is um, a screenshot from uh, Epson's website. And all of this, this character string here in, wrapped in blue, for example, is actually English. And this character set is actually English. And this is actually English. And I draw your attention down here to where it says my Epson. There are four characters here which say Rogu in, which you can probably guess means login. And this one here is pass. Word, which of course is password. And the other things along the top, supporto and uh, downrodo and so on. So a lot of this, a lot of this screen is actually written in English, but it's been transliterated into Japanese characters because I guess the Japanese didn't want to invent their own words for these functions. So they just use the uh, English terms, the English language terms. Now remember this rogoin, because it's going to come up later. Um, the third type of writing is ideograms, which are used in Chinese and in Japanese and in ancient Egyptian. And there's this fine book you can buy, um, The Tale of Peter Rabbit, which has been translated into uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. And the word tail, for example, is represented by this character here, and you can see it's somebody sitting, and it looks like he might be sort of speaking. Um, this Peter tells you it's a name, so here's a person sitting who's named, and last of all, here's a character that looks a bit like a rabbit, but is actually a hare because they didn't have rabbits in Egypt. Now the kanji can all be found uh, in a book such as this one. You can see my somewhat battered and falling apart book copy now. And an interesting feature is that you can have many, many kanji characters which have the same pronunciation. So all of these characters in this column, with the exception of these two, where it clearly says not, and this one, which where it clearly says not, they are all pronounced as K, K, K. Okay, or this one is gay. This one's an this one's an, an alternative version with one of the diacritics. And this is a typical table of uh, kanji that students have to learn. And this is for grade six, which is a level I never achieved. I have just about managed to get to about level one, which is about enough to get you around on the Tokyo subway, which I'm told these days has the station names written in English anyway, but didn't in when I was working there. Now I mentioned the shift keys already. And this is a simulator, a simulator which I've written. Now, when I write these simulators, I try and put the Morse in. And those of you who are radio hams or indeed know Morse for any other reason, will probably recognize that this is not really a Morse character. 
And that's because there are so many characters in Japan, Japanese Morse that they can't actually use the Latin characters. So here's just a sample of the, of the uh, Japanese Morse where the letter A is dash, dash, dot, dash, dash. And there's an I is actually the standard Morse character for the letter A, dot, dash. And U, as it happens, is the same as in Latin. Um, but it goes on. And the characters with the diacritics, like ka becoming ga, has an extra couple of dots to represent the, the ga, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, diacritic that's added to ka to make ga. Now, let's just have a look. I'm going to uh, switch sharing shortly. There's this text here, ro gu in, ro gu in. Add a quick demo. So if I can manage to switch this somehow, and it's of course gone off the bottom of my page of screens. Here we go. Now I'm hoping this is going to work. Yes, that seems to work. Okay, so first of all, upper shift, the keys stay the same, but the display board difference varies. So that's the upper shift version, which I haven't made red yet. That's a, that's a project for the future and the lower shift version. So firstly, I'm going to put in Rogu Inda. And I, if I can find my crib sheet. So first of all, I, type, I need to type in the character Ro. And that's this box here. And you can see it's an upper shift character. So I first of all have to engage upper shift and then hit raw. Oops, I did that twice. I'm going to reset that now. because Right, so raw has been uh, encrypted to the letter single vowel O. And you'll notice I've cheated for my own benefit in that I put the uh, Japanese character transliterations into English or Romaji as it's officially called. So Ro has encrypted to O. The next character I want to encrypt is the Gu. And Gu isn't actually on this keyboard. So what you have to do, in fact, is to use the zero and the one to represent the diacritics. So first of all, Gu is up here, so it's still Okay, I'm going to hit this one anyway, just for luck. It's upper shift. And it's gone to ke. So ke, uh, I hit ke rather than ge, but not to worry. Now, if I wanted to convert that into ge, I would then have to hit one, which then encrypts, encrypts to a ro. Then the lowercase, uh, the I for in, is this character here, which is transliterated to a she. And then lastly, the, uh, re, the uh, N character, which is this one right here. N has been converted into Ri. So you now see that the four characters of the original text, Ro, Gu, In, have been converted into five. So when you're decrypting this message, you have to recognize that every so often you're going to get a decryption of a zero or a one. And that tells you you have to convert the, the character you received before that into a new character by adding the diacritics as you're transcribing it onto paper. Right, back to the... Uh, Back to the next one, which is the Hebrew enigma. Now, this is basically a standard enigma machine, a standard three rotor 26 character enigma. As you can see, the plug board on the front and the keyboard has uh, characters which are clearly not Latin, except for four of them. So there are 22 Hebrew characters. Um, people sometimes tell me, well, actually there should be 27 because there are five special characters which indicate 
uh, one of the 20, uh, five of the 22 Hebrew characters when they are uh, at the ends of words, but in fact, they are not used here. But what you do have are the characters F, V, X, and Y. And a number of us puzzled as to why this was for some time. But uh, eventually, uh, a gentleman uh, at the University of Kassel in Germany pointed out that Hebrew uses Latin Morse. And if you've got 22 characters of Hebrew characters, the Morse characters look like this. So the first letter, for example, Aleph uses Latin A and Beth uses letter B and Gimel uses letter G and so on. So there's approximately a one-to-one -one relationship between the names of the letters and the Latin equivalent and the Morse character that's used. There are exceptions because there are some characters, for example, there are two sorts of, two sorts of S where uh, they've uh, had to use a different character. But what's left over when you take out all of those letters in this list from the full range of A to Z is simply F, V, X, and Y. So F, V, X, and Y retain their own Morse characters in messages which are transmitted using this enigma or having been encrypted using this enigma. Now those characters basically sit in spare places on the Hebrew typewriter assignment. And I have this little uh, encryption system, which I have uh, recently put together. But first of all, uh, I'm now going to switch into Eurovision mode and say, Erev Tov, Natan, you have something to tell us, I think. Yo, yep. Let me see myself. There I am. Okay, am I coming through? Yes. Okay, I was asked to share the story of the Hebrew Enigma. And the story begins when I was curating the exhibition in the Jerusalem Science Museum for Alan Turing here. So about 10 years ago. And we wanted an Enigma. And of course, we couldn't dream of affording to buy one. And then there was a rumor that the Israeli Defense Force has somewhere a few Enigma machines. So it took some effort to find out where, and it took much more effort to get them to, to admit to having them and be willing to loan one to us. I mean, really, it, it went to very high levels in the government to, to get them to agree to, to part with their Enigma machine. And then they sent me the machine. And when it got to the museum, I open it, and I find that it is Hebrew. So all the keys and so on, as you've seen, are in Hebrew. But the machine is definitely a three rotor German machine. The instructions on the inside of the lid are in German. Everything is the same, except for the letters for the actual encoding. So then the question was, what on earth is going on? And we tried to track the, the origin of this thing. And I guess the most likely story, as far as we, we could ascertain, is actually nice. Uh, what happened is, apparently, uh, His Majesty's government felt after the war that it would be a really good idea to give the enigmas they've captured to their ex-colonies uh, without telling the ex-colonies that the Brits could actually uh, decipher the transmissions. Uh, it's a good question, why would they want to decipher them and would they go to the effort and so on? But anyway, they agreed to give these machines to the fledgling state of Israel around then. And so the Israeli army took a few sample machines and tried to test them by converting them to Hebrew. And at that point, one of the people working on this was a young soldier who was also a student of mathematics. And he went to talk to his professor and told him about this great new machine that they have and so on. Now the professor was Joe Gillis, who was quite instrumental in starting up mathematics in academia in, in Israel, actually, I mean, he was an accomplished mathematician. But he also came from Britain, and uh, during the war, he worked at Bletchley Park. So he knew exactly what this machine was and what had been done to it. Unfortunately, he signed, had signed the, the Official Secrets Act, which I'm told the British take very seriously. So he couldn't say anything. On the other hand, he really didn't want Israel to be using a machine that who knows what could be deciphered by others. 
And so he told the student this. He said, have you ever heard the story of the Trojan horse? And that's all he said. So the student took this uh, hint back and it went up the chain of command until it reached David Ben-Gurion, who was the founder and first prime minister of Israel. And he was uh, apparently sufficiently well read to understand the hint. And he simply put a stop to the whole project right then. And what happened then is the machines went into storage. The picture in my mind is that final scene from Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Where the Holy Ark is put in a big box and is put into a huge military storehouse where nobody will ever find it again. And indeed this machine that we got apparently sat there for 70 years eh, until they loaned it to us. So that's what we can think we know about this story. That's it. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, what's an interesting point, of course, is that uh, if, um, if the machines had been used in avoiding the various mistakes that the Germans uh, used by sending doubly encrypted keys and uh, by using really strongly stereotyped messages, that it might still have remained uh, uh, secure for the uh, Israeli Defense Force anyway. But well, you might want to keep in mind that certainly the British didn't tell the Israelis about the mistakes of the Germans and so on. Yes. So ah. They would have been left to our own devices to make our own mistakes, I guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So here we have my simulation of the Hebrew enigma. Uh, this is just much like the uh, Hebrew enigmas that uh, Nathan was just talking about. This machine, uh, it just has a standard rotors. I haven't tried rewiring the rotors or doing anything particularly experimental. I've just taken a, uh, a simulator system, which I already had for the standard enigma, and changed the character set so that it's now using uh, a not particularly nice uh, font for the keyboard. Here, the displays, which are is just down here, and the uh, switchboard, the uh, plug board down here. So if I just encrypt, for example, nice friendly word, which we pronounce in English, probably very badly, shalom. So first of all, I hit the S and the shin, it's changed into a cuff. Um, now, this character is both the English letters S and H combined into one. Uh, next, we need the L, which is here. And it's being converted into a, a tet, a letter T. Uh, now, the next character is mysteriously a V. And I'm not going to go into the uh, reasoning behind all of that, but uh, we now have the Dalet. And finally, the M down here. The M has been converted into the letter called Sade, which is effectively uh, in English terms a Z. And I can uh, then reset the rotors and type in the message that I just got out of my Enigma machine and get Shalom back again. So it's rather more straightforward than the uh, Japanese machine. There's no, uh, no worrying about uh, having to add diacritics and so on. You'll note there's no vowels. Um, what? you're supposed to do if you happen to want to encrypt a foreign word, like an English word or so on, which might have vowels in it, it's not entirely clear because the machines were never actually used. There, there are not, as far as we know, any protocol manuals lying around, although it would be interesting to know if there are. But you notice you can use, you do have these spare F, X, Y, and V, which are spare in, uh, the plain text operating mode. So in theory, you could perhaps use these to indicate vowels or final, final encodings or so on. So, but we don't know. And as they were never used, it's just a, an interesting uh, side thought. Right, back to the main demo, back to the main talk. Next, the Lacida, Lacida, excuse me which is uh, another machine sometimes called a Polish Enigma, but that's just a, uh, a, um, a mistake because it's similar to Enigma, Enigma, but not very similar to Enigma. It's named after the 
inventors or the designers or probably their bosses. So we have Guido Langer, Maximilian Cienczki, and Ludomir Daniel Danilevich, or possibly his brother Leonard Danilevich. And it's a machine that's basically a, um, a typewriter stuck on top, an electric typewriter. And the rotor box is screwed on the front and it's got a couple of locks so that it can only be opened by uh, people who have authority to open it. And you have three wheels sticking through the lid of this box. And you also have up here a switch for encipherment and decipherment. And I'll get on to why that's required in a little while. And there's a display here that tells you if the machine is actually set to cipher, chiffre, or decipher for decipher. The keyboard is a standard uh, uh, Polish keyboard, but it has an interesting feature because of the way the wheels are designed. And this is the Polish version of the same picture, which is, gives slightly more detail of the uh, of what you're seeing. Now, what's actually interesting is the design of this machine, because although you could only three, see three wheels sticking out through the cover, there are in fact no fewer than six wheels, not including the entry and the, the two entry wheels. And there's no reflector. Interestingly, there is no reflector. Now, all the wheels can be turned by hand. If you open the lid, you can set the you would set the wheels by hand. But once the lid has been closed, you can only set three of them. So three of them are required for the daily setting, and then three of them can be set for each message. Now, an interesting feature is that one end, the the rotors are not twenty six all the way through, or any actual convenient number all the way through. There are 24 four at this end and 35 at this end, which means if you're sending data in one direction, you only have 24 characters to play with. And if you're sending data in the other direction, you have 35 to uh, play with. And that affects the keyboard. So, comparison with the three rotor Enigma. Three rotor Enigma has three rotors used twice. You'll remember the current comes in on the right, it goes around the reflector and comes back out through the same three rotors. The cheetah has six rotors. The Enigma has a reflector. The cheetah does not have a reflector. Now, one of the consequences of having a reflector is that no character can encrypt to itself. This, I should have mentioned in the case of the Russian Fialka, has been sort of fixed by there being a thing which is loosely known as a magic circuit, which pseudo-randomly allows a given character to be sent straight through rather than through the wheels. The cheetah has no reflector and a character can encrypt to itself without doing any clever stuff with having to have magic circuits. And that means that the, the bomber machine, which relies on being able to uh, match cribs with encrypted messages can no longer be used. You can no longer use this slide rule device to um, try and work out where the crib is situated because the crib could be anywhere within the message. Enigma wheels have, assuming a three rotor Enigma, 26 possible settings giving you 17,576. Lachida wheels have variously 24, 31, and 35 possible settings, giving you just under 1,000 million possible positions, which is an improvement of approximately 56,000 over Enigma. However, Lachida has no plug board, and the 56,000 uh, factor improvement in the wheel position options is approximately equal to only two cables. So two cables gives you 44,000, and three cables gives you three million and a half or so. So actually it's, it's in the end, not that much better than Enigma. In fact, it's somewhat worse if you're just counting combinations. Because there's no reflector, there is an, an, an explicit N-cipher, D-cipher switch, which I showed you before as the chiffre, de chiffre. 
And the three rotor Enigma can have have the rotors installed in one of six sequences, assuming you only have three rotors to choose from. The cheetah has fixed rotor order. So on Enigma, you are going in to 26 and you're coming through three rotors, then the reflector is 26 to 26, and then you come out again, 26 to 26, and then 26 possible characters out. And I've just shown these to show that this wheel here is the same as this wheel here, and this wheel here is the same as this wheel here. The cedar, on the other hand, is an entry for 24 characters in encryption mode. And at one point, the 24 possible characters becomes 31, and then 31 becomes 35. So you end up with 35 possible characters coming out. In decryption mode, you can put in any one of 35 possible characters, and it comes back out as 24. Now this has an interesting uh, uh, consequence, but first of all, if we just look at this um, uh, coding sheet, there's no reflector, so this column doesn't apply. The Valtzen Lager or the rotor order is fixed, so this column doesn't apply. The wheels have no rings, so this column doesn't apply. And the, there are no plugs, no plug boards, so the Stecker Verbindung column also does not apply. So in fact, the machine is the only thing you can set are the start positions of three of the wheels for a given day, and that's it. Uh, Polish intelligence chiefs decided that maybe their cryptologists who'd already broken Enigma should verify the resistance of the Latida cipher. Um, and on 3rd July, 1941, Marian Rieski and Henryk Zygalski received some received for testing some messages that had been encrypted on Lachida, and they decrypted them in less than two hours. And as you can imagine, there was enormous consternation. Now, a feature of this machine is, as I pointed out already, chiffre and deschiffre. And in cipher mode, you can only input, because there's only 24, uh, 24 positions on the input, only input 24 characters. So the, the, the keyboard is actually 35 keys long, but that means that 11 of them have to be uh, disabled in encipherment mode. But when you're in decipherment mode, all the keys are available. And that's because when you're in encipherment mode, you can type in a text, and you will end up with some keys which you can't actually type in in encipherment mode. So you have to, for decipherment, you have to re you have to operate a switch that says deschiffre, which then says the the data flow is from right to left, and then you are allowed to type in, for example, this two, of which the letter hello, uh, the the O of the hello, was encrypted to. Uh, yes. Now this machine I have equi equipped with an index of coincidence uh, calculator just for fun, you understand. Uh, index of coincidence is, is a way of determining if you've, got a, if you've got a text, you can, by doing a certain amount of math on the numbers, or on the letters and, and how often they each appear, then you can determine whether the the text is encrypted because encrypted text tends to have a flat distribution, which is represented by 0 0.0286 for a 35 character alphabet. Uh, if it is actual plain text, then you can use the index of coincidence sometimes to determine what actual language the uh, original message was written. in. So German is different from English, it's different from Polish and so on. So this is the keyboard and it shows that uh, above this dotted line, only available for decipherment mode. It happens that Q and V aren't used in the Polish language. So you can uh, get away with dis uh, disabling those along with all the numbers. And I guess if you want to type numbers, then you have to do what was generally speaking done on the German Enigma, which is to type them in full. Jeden, Devar, Tri, etc. So that's in encipherment mode and that's in decipherment mode. 
Now, an interesting feature of Polish is that it has a rather a lot of accented characters, which I mentioned already in terms of the Fialka keyboard. And this machine, this Latida, doesn't have any of them, unlike the, unlike the Fialka, which at least had four of them. So the, you can see the argonic, C acute, A argonic, L with a bar, N, O, S, Z acute, and also Z with a dot. None of these exist on the keyboard because all it has is that. And I, I happen to know a bit of Polish and I know that actually it can be crucial that you include these accents. So how the uh, accented characters would be transmitted once again is not known to me because once again, it wasn't used very much and I've never, not managed to find a protocol manual for it. But supposing I wanted to send the text, to jest ważna wiadomość, which means this is an important message. Now, what you could think of doing is just um, uh, adding an X after every letter that needs an accent. So instead of Z with a dot, I would now type encrypt ZX and instead of S acute, C acute, I could do SX and CX. And maybe if you wanted to do Z with the dot, you use two Xs. And I only suggest this because there's another language which has come out of Poland, uh, or what is today's Poland, called Esperanto. And that has a, an alphabetic system with lots of uh, strange accents on, which weren't available on a lot of typewriters when it first came out. And there's a standard has grown up to use the letter X to in to represent uh, uh, letters with accents. Now, a good question is, there were a lot of these Lacidas made, Lachida, and the question then arises, Gujeson Lachida Tzish. And you could also ask the same question about various machines that the Poles invented, the Bombi and the Cyclometri. Where are the Lacidas and everything else today? Now, when the Poles were escaping from the Germans, as the Germans were advancing, they uh, exited from their base at a place called Piri, which is just to the south of Bo Warsaw, on uh, the 6th of September in the evening. And, uh, or indeed, 6th of September in the night. And they moved generally east, Siedlice, Brescia, and then they started to go south to a place called Wusk, L with a bar, U-C-K. And then they went to the left a little ways to a place called Uchiwug. And they arrived on the 12th of uh, September or the 13th of September. These letters are assigned to various people who were in the, <laughs> who were doing the, uh, doing the moving. And in Ushiwuk, it is said they dug a very big hole. Oh, they dug a very big hole and burned everything. So somewhere around Ushiwuk, there's a hole waiting to be dug to find all these abandoned decryption systems. This story is told in Dermot Turing's X, Y, and Z book, X, Y, and Z, if you prefer, which is also available in Polish, Prabziva Historia Zwamania Shifru Enigma, and also as of about a year, it's become disponible on a long Francaise as well. I don't think anybody here speaks French, so that probably doesn't help. And this is a map, a modern map of the area. And here we have Lutsk, which is now, you will notice, been re-spilled and also written in Cyrillic. And the road that they took to the west to Ushiwug is now called Ustiluch, and it's also called Ustiluch in Cyrillic. And that's because, unfortunately, this area that was conveniently in Poland is now in Ukraine. So that means if you're going to dig your hole to see if you can find any of the uh, Polish remnants, then you've got to get permission from the Ukrainian government as well. And I wish you good luck with that. Now, uh, 
A bit of research which I'm thinking of doing is trying to work out how easy it is actually to crack the cedar by sending myself some messages. It, can I create, for example, a, a uh, cyclometra polski? Can I create bomba to uh, exhibit females, the facility of females? The answer is probably not because I'm told that that's most entirely the, these cyclic properties are almost entirely caused by having the original enigma having a reflector. So Lashida not having a reflector, I may not be going to get anywhere. Uh, the details, if you want to read anything more about the Polish cipher machine, uh, there's a couple of uh, publications by a gentleman called Krzysztof Gai. Uh, they're all in Polish, unfortunately. Oh, except for this one, Enigma Bulletin. Um, although he, these days he's based in a university in the USA and I've completely forgotten which one. But that completes my talk for this afternoon, for this evening. I notice it's gotten dark. So I'm just going to say, does anybody want to ask any questions, make any comments? We still have about a quarter of an hour before this slot finishes. So you're welcome to either throw your comments up on chat or unmute yourself and speak. I think you can unmute yourself without my permission. Yes, you can. <laughs> Shalom. Sir, yes. Yeah, my question is this. So the, this business of all the accented characters uh, being essential. I mean, we here are pretty used to, to dealing with French and other languages and ignoring the accents completely and Google understands it and we understand it. What mm. is special about Polish that if you just use the letter Z without the various accents, people couldn't reconstruct it in their minds? Well, in some of those accents, it does work like that. But for example, um, persons in verbs, for example, the first person singular of a verb, the I form, is represented by an E, is an ending, which is an E with a hook. But the third person singular in some verbs is represented by an E without the hook, and it changes oh. both the pronunciation and the, uh, the writing. Now, yeah, indeed, you could get over that by using the, you, by always putting in the personal pronouns, ya for I and on and ona for he and she. That it does matter sometimes, and you'd have to redesign your text a bit without have if you don't have any of the diacritics. Got it. Okay. And there's also case endings as well, which uh, which change. So the nominative singular of feminine nouns has no uh, ha ha has an a without a hook, and the instrumental and <laughs> accusative has an has an a with a hook. So you can't always reconstruct everything. Okay, that explains it, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else or are you all just baffled or exhausted? Well, I guess, I guess that's it. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. This recording will appear on our YouTube channel in due course. You're welcome to watch it again, of course. But for now, I will say thank you very much. Yep. And, I, and I will just do one last thing, which is one last show. I'm going to talk very swiftly about the next lectures which are coming up. So just on Wednesday of next week, we have a lecture about uh, basically mathematics, computers and radio astronomy in Cambridge. And then on September 28th, I have a professor, Chris Christensen, from the uh, Northern Kentucky University, who's going to talk to us about the Imperial Japanese navies, crypto machines. Um, and then October, we have a couple of talks. First one about early computer graphics. And on Wednesday, I have Klaus Schmey and Elonka Dunin, who was immortalized in a Dan Brown book as Nola K who's going to talk about solving historical ciphers using modern means. And uh, I hope maybe some of you will be able to come and attend some of those. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to say thank you very much. And Laila Tov, good night. <laughs>